So the question I wanted to ask you is in food specifically, I think I think um you can do it a lot with food. The, the biggest example is it's almost like why what is happening in the human brain? Like why do humans love kind of alliteration and, and onomatopoeia mm -hmm. with when buying things? Like what's actually happening? So the, the I think it's the fucking best and it, it generally it does something palpable to my, it kind of gets me drooling like a famished Rottweiler. When I drive past the McDonald's, uh, it's the McMuffin mm. sign and it says 745A, mm, and it's loads of M's. And it's like, that to me is like that, it's that, uh, the M mm of the morning, like waking up, the M mm of the like, you have to admit, by the way, in marketing terms, the McDonald's have played a blinder, really. Yeah, they're the, I think they're the best. They're the yeah, best. Yeah. Oh, but what, yeah, but on like, I don't know if you know what that, but what is happening? Like, why, why is it when, when humans, and it happens a lot in food and just in marketing, um, the other example, KFC, I, I, um, I had the, one of the second guys I've had on the podcast is, um, he's like a language, um, he built this AI tool that's obsessed with language. And he had three different versions of language. He had um, uh, uh, sense. No, what did he have? He had factual language, which which is words that a bit, a bit on the wanky side, right? Is what companies love, but humans hate. So it'd be like corporate social responsibility or yeah, yeah. really hard words yeah. to digest. Sensory language is is words like in terms of food. It would be like let's use KFC as an example. It would be like warm finger licking good well yeah but so that's so that no it'd be warm lick warm um warm delicious chicken would be picture um sensory language picture language which is like the most persuasive form of language he says is something that creates a picture so finger licking good like it's almost the, the hard constant sounds is almost like the cantankerous crispy chicken finger licking good like that really i don't know but i'm trying to work out from you and it's authentically kind of southern it's got yeah. I mean, in terms of three words that do the job it's, oh, it's, it's a genius property. have you yeah. seen when, yeah. when kfc run out of chicken yeah and they changed the name to F fck fuck yeah, yeah it's yeah. so good yeah so what is happening with when when what's happening to humans when we see onomatopoeia or we see alliteration well, I mean, the language around food is fascinating because, you know, I mean, one of the things is that there are various things that will increase the price that people are willing to pay for food on a menu. One of them is provenance. If you put Pembrokeshire potatoes or Jersey this or whatever, yeah. anything that has a place of origin commands a premium. And weirdly, just, you know, seemingly meaningless words like succulent carrots rather than just carrots. Also, uh, there's a whole um, extraordinary science of menu design um, which goes into detail like, you know, you don't put the pound sign, you spell the price out in words rather than doing it in digits. You uh, get rid of you get rid of the second two digits, so you just have round pound pricing. People experiment enormously with this, which is what conveys promise. But you're right in that um, it you can't separate... Okay, I'll, I'll get into a tiny bit into the neuroscience of this. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to get to. Um, yeah. Which is that it looks as though most of what we perceive is a prediction and that we use our senses to error correct where the prediction deviates from the reality. And that's a more efficient data architecture for the brain than effectively me looking at the picture in front of me and processing every pixel. If, if you're into digital photography, you'll be familiar with something called raw mode. If you've got a fancy digital camera, you can shoot in raw mode where there's basically um, a few bits are used to describe each pixel in painstaking, intricate detail. Every single pixel is described. The reason you do that as a professional photographer is for editing, it's better. The way you achieve a JPEG or an MPEG is through a form of data compression where there is a likely value for each pixel based on the pixel that precedes it or adjoins it, okay? And you only use data to describe the extent to which the pixel value differs from the expected value. And that's a much more economical use of data because if you've got a blue wall, you don't need the data going blue, 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 blue for every pixel, okay? You just go blue and then one single bit, same again, okay? Same again, same again, same again, same again, same again. Yeah. Okay, so that... I've, I've probably done a complete disservice to the genius people who um, who do um, effectively data compression in photography. That effectively is you have an expected value for everything and you use data to only to the extent that the reality differs from the expectation. 
The book you need to read on this is by a guy called Andy Clark. It's called The Experience Machine. He's an academic at the University of Sussex. He's a philosopher as well as being a kind of neuroscientist. Um, and Andy Clark's book, The Experience Machine, effectively takes this model of human perception, which is the brain generates an expectation and then the senses then convey the contrast between the reality and the expectation. If it's right, it's not a new theory. Clark admits this. It was advanced first by people, I think, like William James and Hermann von Helmholtz in the 19th century. Um, Hermann von Helmholtz and Co. didn't have the advantages of JPEGs and MPEGs to understand data architecture. They didn't have really the advantage of information theory to understand why the brain would work that way. But we've got limited bat bandwidth in the optic nerve. It makes more sense for the optic nerve to concentrate on surprising information than to concentrate on all information. And if that's true, it explains essentially, I'd say the verdict of that is the science is in and the marketers were right all along, that things don't taste how they taste. They taste a strange combination of how they taste and how you expected them to taste. And there's a guy you must get on the show who's called Charles Spence at the University of Oxford, who's a kind of... Um, how would you describe it? I suppose you call it psychophysics or or else you might call it phenomenology. But it's all about the science of how, not not the science of how we measure the world as scientists, mm -hmm. i.e. degrees centigrade, but how we experience reality as human beings. Now, you'll know this if you've been to America. The weather forecast will say, you know, tomorrow at Scottsdale, it's going to be 97, feel, but it feels like 92. And American weather forecasts often have a feels-like temperature which is not the actual objective temperature of the air. It factors in things like whether there's a breeze and the level of humidity, both of which affect how we as humans experience heat. You know, high humidity, no breeze is a really painfully hot day. If you add a breeze and reduce the humidity and leave the temperature the same, I've wandered around places like Phoenix, Arizona, when it's 100 degrees, but because the humidity is really low, you basically wander around perfectly comfortable. The same temperature in Singapore, you're sweating like a sex offender, right? <laughs> okay, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so, the, so Spence's work, particularly around taste, he'll do things like wonderful experiments where you produce something that looks like a lemon, okay? Looks exactly like a bitter citrus fruit, but you flavour it with strawberry essence. And the only scientific way to describe the human reaction to this is it fucks with people's heads. It, so in other words, you don't go, gosh, that looked like a lemon, but it's actually strawberry. That's, that's, that's how you'd expect if, if, if the anti Clark theory isn't true. Instead, it almost creates a completely new taste, which is the taste of something that's strawberry-like when you expected it to be lemon. So the marketing of food... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, you know... The expectation you create when somebody goes in has a huge bearing on what they perceive, just as, it, as they always used to say about lager, people don't drink the beer, they drink the advertising. And so the onomatopoeia, because let's, let's use KFC as, as an example, finger licking good, right? So mm. I was in Colombia and um, I, before Costa Rica, I was in Colombia. So the food in Santa Marta was, um, was re repugnant. Like, and I, and I was just which was, the food in Cartagena was amazing, but in Santa Marta, this other seaside town, which, as you said, was like, as your uh, wife said, it's like watching narcos, right? <laughs> Got mugged there as well, but I won't tell you about that, but that's the same sort of thing. But I was like, I just need some sort of um, normality. I need, yeah. and I saw the finger licking good signs. I saw the KFC, the kind of, the lurid lights. <laughs> it, yeah. And I was like, oh my God, that's the promise. And as you were saying about um, yeah. your friend at the University of Sussex, because it's like, we're, we're waiting for that kind of, what we expect and, we, and we're almost like speeding up to what we actually get. Well, I, I can remember a similar experience getting stuck in quite heavy snow, crossing the Rockies between Taos, New Mexico and Farmington, New Mexico. And all I can remember is we were terrified because there was no mobile signal. If you went off the road, this was a road where it's, it's incomprehensible to Brits, but you're driving through northern New Mexico and you will go for 40 miles without seeing a car or a house or a building of any kind. You know, once after about 50 miles, you come across a truck stop, truck stop, you go another 50 miles, not a single house, just wood, and the snow was falling and the temperature was dropping. 
And I was convinced we we're going to, you know, because it was getting increasingly snowy, we weren't in a four by four, we we're going to go off the road. I remember finally getting into Farmington and seeing a sign saying Burger King. Oh, and it wait. was, it, seriously, it was, it was, you know, my reaction was, you know, it was like the promised land, you know, yes, you know yes. at last, you yes, know. Yes. And, um, and, and, and of course, we've got to understand, of course, with food, that there is the food that gets written about, which is the food that is remarkably good. Okay, typically. Yeah. Most of the time when we eat, our deepest unconscious psychology isn't attempting to uh, effectively use food as a form of status signaling or a form of, you know, extraordinary entertainment. It's actually, is this okay to eat? Yeah, that's that's our evolutionary instinct. It's, you know, basically, the great thing about, they were, I call this, this is called satisficing. Okay. Yes. And the reason McDonald's is so successful is not because it's the best restaurant in the world. Yeah. It's Nando's. Um, uh, it's because it's um, it's incredibly good at not being bad. So when you go there, you know what you get. It's going to be entirely expected. It's going to be very predictable. The bun has been toasted for one minute and 39 seconds. There are no surprises. It's exactly what like, as it was last time. It's exactly what you expect it to be. And as a consequence, it's a very, very successful mind hack. Because, you know, Nassim Taleb writes about this. He was baffled to see people eating at McDonald's at Milan Railway Station. You know, Milan, pretty good foodie city. And the point was that people weren't looking for great food. They were looking for food that definitely wasn't bad. But on, but also, that's that we, we talked about the promise, the promised land. So I eventually go to this KFC in San, Santa Marta, and I'm craving it. I, the food arrives. I get this. I get the full full shebang. I get wings. I get tenders. I get fucking everything. It was horrendously bad. It was the chicken was rank. What at KFC? The KFC, and I was like, I, I couldn't believe it. But the, the, what, what in terms of like the promise? And then we you know, you know we've talked about like we we want these things the kind of what we've got in our head and the expectations be met. With a with a chain when you when it is kind of the, you, you see know, you have to be absolutely. You know, this was, I suppose, Ray Kroc's great, you know, yeah. insight. You have to be absolutely <laughs> fascistically consistent in what you deliver. Yeah. And, I mean, it might have been a fake KFC or else the local franchisee has gone rogue. I don't, but, the, but so then to your point, the, the, this one thing you notice when you try McDonald's or and or Burger King in a different country is you have the similarities of home, but the differences. Yes, yes. And I've always found that how you keep consistency yet let yet tailor tailorize to localized markets that conundrum is fascinating. The McDonald's, I got McDonald's delivery on uh, Rappi, which is their equivalent of Deliveroo. Yeah. I, I was like, I may as well have been ejaculating when I was eating it because it was so... It was exactly... It was, it was, uh, it was, yeah, I was, yeah, it was yeah. like I could have gone down to um, the, the McDonald's in Liverpool Street. Do you know what I mean? It was exactly the same. I was like, and that is the promise I wanted. Do you know what I mean? Of course, of course. And, I, that, that, and of course, that's also true of hotel chains. Yeah. That we forget, you know, if you're a frequent hotel stayer, Quite often, what you want is absolute predictability. 